Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Lisberg with DJI. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm, I'm a chronically late webinar attendee, and I want to make penance for my, the ills in my past by uh, starting on time for those of you who are gracious enough to be here right on time this morning. Um, thank you for being here today. It's a real honor to be able to uh, do the, the cleanup, be, to be the cleanup hitter for the Public Safety Month webinar series sponsored by DJI Enterprise. Um, I joined DJI in the spring of 2016, five and a half years ago. I'm the head of our PR operation in North America, and I take the lead on our messaging for policy issues such as government relations, uh, government regulation, and flight safety. Um, and one of the things that I am most proud of at DJI is how we've tracked and counted and promoted what I think is the most amazing application of drone technology, how it has absolutely revolutionized the business of saving lives. So the, I, I, now I, I want to be very clear. I am not an expert in public safety, not in the slightest. Um, this is the sixth of our DJ Enterprises public safety webinars. Every single person who spoke in the first five of those it knows more about public safety and has done more in public safety than me. Um, if I am on your fire ground or on, at your command post at, a, at an incident, the best thing that you would want me to do there is to stand behind the yellow tape. Um, but my specialty as the communications guy is in finding the stories and the messages that do the best job of telling the wider story uh, to the wider world of how transformational drone technology is. So that's what we've tried to do here today. Um, that's the real story here. Uh, 10 years ago, to take yourself back, 10 years ago, if you got lost on a hike and were stuck on a trail when it started snowing, you would better hope that the local sheriff's office had a mounted patrol or some really good backcountry hikers to come find you. Um, maybe you would hope that the state police could fly a helicopter if the weather wasn't too bad. In, Ten years ago, if your toddler or your grandmother wandered out your back door into the cornfield on a hot summer day, you would better round up everybody in the county to start walking grid patterns in that field and hope that you found them before it was too late. That was just 10 years ago. Today, today you can walk into a Costco or a Best Buy and for under $1,000, you can find a basic flying robot with a high resolution camera that can uh, give you the perspective that used to be reserved for airplanes and helicopters and birds. If, you, if you're able to get a few thousand dollars more, if your department's able to get a grant or you're at a particularly well-funded place, you can spend a few thousand more. You can get a, a small drone that has a spotlight, that has a loudspeaker to tell people that help is on the way to them, um, and that has a thermal imaging camera so you can see through the dark. I mean, this is, it, we're, we're used to it because of the transformation has happened so quickly now. But it is astonishing to think back about how quickly this has happened. This is as transformational as when police officers first got cars or when fire crews first got two-way radios. Now, 10 years ago, rescuing someone with a drone was so unusual, it sometimes made national news. The story uh, showing you here is from 2015. That was a Washington Post story about a pretty amazing drone rescue where it, you can, see, you can see in the headline, fire chief uh, used his personal drone to bring a life vest to a kid who climbed out on some rocks and then got caught uh, when the floodwaters raged higher. Um, this was national news in 2015. Today, it's so common, sometimes it doesn't even make the local news. And that is precisely why we made the DJI drone rescue map. We wanted to create the definitive record for the public of how this transformation is shaping public safety around the world, reshaping public safety, really. Um, we wanted to recognize the police, the firefighters, the rescue squads, the search and rescue volunteers, and in some cases, the Good Samaritans, who just happened to be in the right place at the right time with the drone. And suddenly, they could do things that they never could before. And we wanted to be able to show this to the media, to the general public, which learns about things from the media, to the government officials that learn about things in the media and have to respond to the general public. All these people shape the public opinions about drones. Um, and you know, remember, it, as I'm sure you all know, not everybody is always uh, excited about drones. Not everybody is enthusiastic. And drones are, uh, in, in some places, still controversial. 
people think that drones are going to spy on them or are an un, 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 un unfair use of government power. People are suspicious, people are worried. And um, you know, our job as people who are interested in using drone technology for the greater good is not to tell them that they're wrong, but to try to address their concerns and show them the real benefits, the real clear benefits that drones can bring to the world. And you know, one of the other reasons that we made the drone rescue map is that we wanted to make clear that these incidents that aren't just amazing on their own. They're always going to be great stories, that, you know, like the one I just showed you, or like plenty that I'm sure you have in mind. But it's the accumulated weight of all these. These are the vanguard of an entirely new way for public safety to operate. This story is from Antioch, California, uh, early on Saturday morning. The police there used their drone to find a woman who had somehow walked out on the decrepit pier in the dark. She says she fell asleep when the tide came in. She was trapped. She had no idea where she was. She couldn't describe her location. She called 911. Police were able, police in Antioch had already used their drone to rescue two other people in a completely separate incident last year near the a different fishing pier there. So they put their drone out again, were able to spot her and got a fire department rescue boat to go find her. Um, I'm putting this in here because by our count, this is at least the 763rd person around the world to be rescued from danger thanks to a drone, which is, again, astonishing considering the very first one that we know of was in, only in 2013. So in eight years, that 763 people, some of them clearly would have died without the intervention of a drone. Some of them, they probably would have been fine, but it would have taken them longer to get to safety. Uh, they would have had to put searchers at more risk and, and cost to themselves to, to bring them home safely. Um, 763 people is just an astonishing number. And we always have to say at least 763 because we know that we are missing plenty more people. We need you to spread the word about the DJI drone rescue map because we want to acknowledge all of these amazing rescues that have happened around the world. So the number is imperfect, we know that, but here is a, a good round of, of what we know. Drones have rescued people in at least 35 countries and on every continent except Antarctica. People have been rescued by drones in 37 US states and two territories. So Arkansas, Delaware, Idaho, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Nevada, North Dakota, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, West Virginia, Wyoming, get to work. The youngest person, uh, we, we've, we've seen several cases where babies, kids just under or just over one year old were part of a group that got rescued. Unfortunately, none of them were out on their own. Uh, we, we, there have been toddlers, three, four, five, six years old who have wandered off and been found by drones. Um, but there have been a number of babies rescued as part of a larger group with a family. The oldest person we've found rescued by a drone, 98 years old. I used to be excited when I'd see a news story about someone who, who was rescued at, uh, in their 80s, but uh, so many of them, we, we, we can't even keep up. Um, uh, there, there are, I had, and I must confess, uh, a lot of you on this may know this, um, but I had no idea how many elderly people with dementia or other mental health issues end up wandering off. It's a really sobering number. Um, there are so many people who, have uh, there are dozens and dozens of people who have gained extra years of life because a drone was able to find them and found them curled up in a fetal position on a cold night dressed only in a house dress and they survived and thriving thanks to the drone uh, i'm putting up some these are just a, a random collection of images from the, the different public safety agencies have put out when they have successfully completed the drone rescue um, it, roughly half of the drone rescues that we've uh, that we've noted appear to have been accomplished with a thermal camera. Usually at night, um, sometimes through dense vegetation, um, some, it, it, as you all know better than me, thermal cameras uh, have their drawbacks during daylight, but it has been used in a variety of situations like that. Um, about 80% of drone rescues are search and rescue operations, finding people on mountains and fields uh, in, in brush, along water courses like shorelines or riverbanks where it can be tough to see them from uh, even a few hundred feet away where the drone, the, the aerial perspective of the drone makes all the difference. Um, the other 20%, most of them are cases where a drone helped deliver supplies, whether it's a life preserver, 
um, food and water um, to a, a, a first uh, 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 granola bars or uh, something like that to people who have to wait until water recedes to get to a safe place, for example. Um, there have been several cases where the drone spotlight has been used to illuminate the rescue scene so that the rescuers can plot a route there, plot a route back, safely work to um, get people out. And then some crazy outliers. Uh, there was a case in Brazil where someone, a, a film crew, was lost on an extremely remote plantation. Uh, their, their vehicle broke down. They tied a, a, a note to the bottom of their Mavic, flew it up in the air until they found a farmer several miles away who had, had no idea what a drone was uh, and just sees this thing coming out of the sky, um, but managed to get him to open the note at the bottom of them that gave the location of where they were and he was able to call authorities to rescue him. Um, we had another case in Australia recently where a family was stranded by a, a landslide that knocked out their roadway. They were able to um, uh, they, they had no cell service, but they figured out maybe they can get one if they go farther. So they sent, they typed out a text message to rescuers and pushed send, hung it from the bottom of the drone, put it up as far as it could go, left it up there as long as they could. And just as they expected, it eventually made connection to a cell tower, sent the signal and they got rescued the next day. So the, the, your your imagination is uh, is is going to try to come up with things, and reality is going to top it every time. Um, so how did we get here? The 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 drone rescue map um, was a long time in the coming. We have to go way back into prehistoric drone times, and you know, and drone drone years are like dog years. So that means like five years ago, five six years ago. Um, go back to 2016. There was there was no M300 RTK with the laser range finder to give you an exact GPS location. There was no M210 RTK. There was no Mavic 2 Enterprise that gave you thermal in a backpack in the trunk of the car. In 2016, the Phantom 4 came out in the spring of that year. The Inspire 2 came out in the fall of that year. Um, and just as important, Part 107 in the United States took effect that year. It's hard to believe this, but it was only five years ago that flying a drone for a professional purpose without an airplane pilot's license or a balloon pilot's license became legal. Until then, the FAA did not want people flying drones for uh, professional purposes unless they had airplane level certifications. And uh, many of you know Brendan Shulman, our recently departed uh, vice, former vice president of policy and legal affairs. He made his name uh, in the drone world two years before he, or a year before he joined DJI uh, in 2014, he, on behalf of a Texas search and rescue group, he sued the FAA. This group wanted to use drones to save lives and the FAA said, no, that's not allowed. And they didn't even do it in a, in a smart procedural way. So Brendan was able to get an appeals court to overturn the FAA's ruling. And that um, opened the floodgates for the beginnings of public safety use of drones. It's, it's hard to believe that that was, the story you see here was only seven years ago. And I said, you know, drone history, drone years go quickly, and prehistoric drone times of seven years ago, that was definitely a prehistoric way of looking at drones. So the, the stories that you see all the time now, drones rescuing people and finding missing people, they barely existed. You just, it, every, sing, every time you saw one, it was news. Um, but they, they mattered to us at DJI because there's no better demonstration of the value of drone technology than literally saving someone's life. Now, I started the DJI in the spring of 2016, right as all these changes were happening. Uh, I pulled together all the stories that we had seen. Uh, Brendan had put together a list of them. Um, of Romeo Dersher, our former senior director of public safety at DJI, had a lot of examples of drone rescues from all over the world through his contacts and the many languages he speaks. They all sent me all the, the clips and stories and uh, Facebook posts that they've seen. I went through and figured out which ones you could truly say that the drone helped make a difference in that rescue as opposed to just being flown as part of the mission and put them in a spreadsheet. There were five of them, but more of them kept happening and I kept adding them to the spreadsheet. And then we had the, the, the biggest uh, sea change that I remember was July of 2016. I came across a news story about an elderly man in rural Iowa. He and his granddaughter, they like floating down the Des Moines River in their little boat in a rural area. 
and um, they would have done it a thousand times, but this time there, the water course uh, had recently had some flooding through it and they got hung up on a log jam. And you can see this is a still from the drone video. Um, so he got out, tried to free them from the jam and he was having a rough time doing it. The, the swamp was a pretty um, dense area. As he's doing it, he starts feeling sick. And as it turns out, he was having a heart attack. He got diagnosed with that in the hospital. So he was going bad fast and it was getting dark. So he calls 911. The sheriff's office was able to ping his cell phone, but not well enough to really find a location. The sheriff's deputies got out of their squads and were walking in the area. They could hear them. They were shouting back and forth, but the, 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 the forest and the swamp was so dense that even though they could hear them, they could not find them. So they brought out their drone and within five minutes, this is the scene that they were able to see on their screen. Now, I remember this one very well because it was the first case I'd seen since I joined DJI that the drone clearly, no question, saved someone's life. Uh, this also happened on my birthday, so I remember that very well. It was it was a great birthday present for me and a new job, right? Uh, I was so excited about that. I ran into a meeting and I did on an unrelated topic. I told everyone, we finally found the case that shows that drones are literally saving someone's life. Um, so I reached out to the Cossack County, Iowa Sheriff's Office to learn more about the case. And they were kind enough to send me the video from the rescue. And then my next call was to a contact of mine at CNN. The same reporter who had written about that story uh, about the rescue in Maine in 2015 was now at CNN. So he certainly understood the value of, of what's uh, of, of drone technology. I, I, I said, yeah, I got a great video out of Iowa. I think you might be able to do something with it. And let me show you what he was able to do with it. Oh, let me try showing you. There we go. Pardon me while I try to get back to my screen. Pardon me, I am, I am as bad at flying a drone as I am at directing a webinar, so please bear with me here. So, All right, if you are, no, oh, that's not the right one. Pardon me here. All right, I hope you're able to see this now. If you're not, please, somebody let me know in the chat, um, but I hope this is working for you. Um, this, uh, this story from the, uh, from, uh, from CNN was, uh, it was amazing. It, it, you know, we were all heartened by seeing it. The sheriff's office in Iowa was thrilled. They, they just in turn brought a lot of news coverage even internationally. Um, this was only five years ago. It was a big deal. Um, drones were, drone rescues were starting to happen, but in all of 
2016, we only counted 11 drone rescue incidents all over the world. Uh, it was a great story on CNN then. Today, I don't think it would go that far. Um, but to put their drone program on the map at the time, Cossack County, Iowa, they had just bought the Phantom 4. They hadn't used it yet. They were worried about negative public perceptions from deploying it regularly. Like I was saying before, there are, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, there are people who think that any drone in the sky is Big Brother's fine. I mean, they don't like it. If their neighbor has a drone, they really don't like it. If the government, the police have a drone. Um, this, so we're, we're glad that this helped inspire people to, to see what uh, it's the best thing that a drone can do. And that Cossack County felt like after they had shown the people in their county what a drone could do and empowered them to be able to get more life-saving technology to do more. Um, they, they got inspired with a thermal camera. They started using their drones more frequently. And since then, they have continued saving people on that very river. So I love this story for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to call them lessons number one and number two for today. So lesson one is that rescuing people from danger, that's the very best way to demonstrate the value of drone technology. They're, they're new, they're scary to a lot of people. Are they spying on people? Are they peeping your windows? Are the police gonna look in your window and see if you watch what you're doing and see if they should you know, arrest you for something? Are the, are the town code enforcement people gonna look in your backyard and see whether the, your patio is too close to your fence line? Um, you know, we, these are actually reasonable questions. A lot of people are gonna have them. And reasonable people are, are going to answer them differently. Different parts of the country, different people with different experiences in life, they're going to answer them differently. And they all need to be addressed through the usual community um, outreach that, that public safety agencies are used to doing. But um, if you ask, should a drone be allowed to find a missing child or a lost person with a mess medical emergency, the answer is always going to be yes. And if you believe that drone technology is a positive force for public safety, these are the examples that matter. So that is, as I said, one of the reasons that we created the map. We wanted an easy reference for public safety agencies to show their leadership and their communities, what a drone can do for them. And at a time back in 2016, the media was full of stories about drones that were supposedly striking airplanes and endangering people's lives. We wanted the media to have an easy and reliable reference for just how often this crazy new technology is doing something unquestionably good. And that brings me to lesson two from here, which is when you're doing something with a drone that could have an amazing outcome, you should always record the video. This is pursuant to your department's records generation and retention policy. I know every department is different and some is a matter of policy, don't record. But if, if you're not barred from doing it, my strong advice, go ahead and record. Maybe nothing happens. Probably nothing is going to happen. That's the story of public safety, right? If you spend hours and hours sitting and waiting while nothing happens. But uh, if you're allowed to, go ahead and run the video. It costs you nothing. You can tape it over tomorrow. But if you run the video, uh, first of all, you can go back later and you can review it. Maybe you can. Uh, there are several cases out there of drone rescues where the person operating the drone looking at the little screen and on the controller missed something, but somebody uh, later was able to spot a, a, a telltale sign of a missing person. There, there's a drone rescue in Poland recently that used a specialized piece of software that analyzed all the, the, the shots taken by the drone and found the person within minutes. Um, in, in the webinar a week or two ago, you um, heard from Cal North Force and Weaver County Search and Rescue in Utah, who said they have a designated person as part of their search and search as part of their search and rescue protocol. They have a person they call a squinter who just looks at a big screen monitor of the live view of the drone in case other people miss something. Um, it, it, all, taping what whatever you see is extremely helpful for training. You can, you can critique your flying skills. You can critique your search strategy. You can show the people on the ground what they look like from the sky so they have a better idea of how you're going to be communicating in the future. And if you happen to be on the sticks when you find that missing child, you will want to share that video with the world. You will want to watch it over and over again. Um, there is there there is going to be no greater feeling. You are going to be really proud. Your department is going to be proud. People are going to want to see that for years. And when you get that video, please send it to us so we can add it to them. All right. So when we uh, started pulling these together, we realized that we, we, we had this spreadsheet and we tried to publicize the individual rescues, but there's so much more potential. 
Um, I wanted to be able to show the media that drones rescuing people wasn't a one-off phenomenon. It was a significant shift in public safety. Drones were becoming a mainstream tool in public safety. Brennan Schulman wanted to be able to show policymakers that drones weren't just toys, they deserve a place in the sky, and that when you allow people to fly drones, good things are going to happen. So we took the rescues in our spreadsheet, we did some basic analysis of them, and put them together in a report that would make it easy to understand how drones were transforming public safety. We didn't include incidents where a drone was simply involved in the rescue, it had to make a significant contribution like finding the missing person or delivering emergency material or helping rescuers plot a route to safety. Same, and, and then um, almost every report that we saw back then of a drone rescue was a situation where the drone really may have saved someone's life. There's this, the, the cover image here was from a rescue in China, someone trapped in a raging river, you can see it bringing them water. There are similar images of life preservers being brought to people or unconscious people found outside on a freezing cold night. So it seemed natural we called that report Lives Saved. It was only six pages long, but when we published that report in 2017, it was a big hit. We counted 59 people rescued by drones in 18 different incidents all over the world. When you did the math, drones were saving one life a week on average, which is really impressive for something that the FAA said was illegal just a few years earlier. By the way, in case you're wondering, in all of our reports on the drone rescue map, we have never made any mention of who made the drones used in these rescues. If they, if it came up, uh, you know, we didn't excise it, but we have always included rescues from, no, no matter what, who manufactured the drone, big rival, small homemade drone, doesn't matter. This is, a, this is not a sales tool, this is not a marketing tool, this is a public service for the drone rescue community and for the world to see. We, if, if someone saves, uh, someone rescues someone today uh, with a drone from our competitors, great. I want to add that in here too and you know, give them plenty of credit for that. The more, the better. Uh, they saved a life. We don't care who made it. Um, it is, this is not a tool to promote DJI drones. They're, they're, we have a whole marketing department, don't get me wrong, but this is not a tool to promote DJI drones over the inferior models that our competitors put out. This is to show the benefits of drone technology overall. Now, when that first report came out in 2017, it got a fair amount of news coverage. Uh, again, not about DJI, but about the transformation drones were enabling, which is exactly what we want. And it, it, it summarized the phenomenon that was underway. It gave news outlets a way to get into that story. And this coincided with a time when drones started to be used more widely. Which proved our point thanks to part 107 thanks to um, the, the burgeoning consumer market from drones and finally public safety agencies had a powerful capable affordable drone that could see through the darkness and be deployed anywhere most agencies were just buying consumer level drones some had inspires so they could attach a thermal camera but um, whatever people were using it was making a difference the faa is encouraging first responders to use drones the number of American public safety agencies using drones, they shot up 50% in two years. There were 1,000 in 2018, there were 1,500 in 2020. And as more public safety agencies get drones, they start to rescue more people. And it wasn't just life or death style searches anymore. It was more routine calls from service, like someone lost in the woods, who was well protected from the elements, they had plenty of water, but it was nice to find them. Someone was caught on the other side of the river, they weren't in danger, but it was it was going to be safer to pull them out on a boat than at, in, after daylight. So in the meantime, a drone could bring them beef jerky and water bottles and granola bars. Um, we we stopped. We made an internal decision that we could no longer really call all of these lives saved, but uh, they're still incredibly important. And that um, brings me to lesson three in, in this, which is that rescuing people with drones it's good for the people doing the rescuing too. This took me a while to realize that um, while all of these rescues are an amazing human story, it does make life easier on the rescuers as well. As well. I learned this, I, I used to be a newspaper reporter. So when I was working on these first reports, I started calling around to police and fire departments to follow up on news stories that I seemed to ask them for details. And as the former reporter, I'm pushing for details. How did it feel to see this? Was it amazing when you saw them pop up on the screen there? What was it like to watch their, their grandmother reunited with the family? And finally, and I didn't always get what I was looking for, and finally I had a deputy sheriff or a, a sheriff uh, tell me on the phone, he said, yeah, 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 that, that, that one was really nice. You know what I was most glad about? I was glad we didn't have to pull my deputies off the road, have them start walking a search grid. I'm glad I didn't have to call in more people on overtime because I'm already over my overtime budget. I'm glad that I don't have to risk that one of them that I pull in is gonna twist his ankle in a gopher hole and then they're gonna go out on disability. 
and I got to cover his shifts. Um, and suddenly I realized that, yes, saving a life is an incredible benefit, you, you, you know, of course, but um, for the effective management of an incident and for a public safety department, drones are an incalculable tool in that way as well. Now, the drone rescues kept happening. There were more and more great examples happening around the world. So we, the next year, 2018, we put out a follow-up report. We called it, because we're very creative here, we called it More Lives Saved. First report, we counted 59 people. This time, a year later, we counted 65 more people. So the, the pace is quickening. Um, the, the still image on the front of the report was rescue from Lincolnshire in England, which um, this was their first rescue, by the way, over the weekend, they had their seventh drone rescue. It's a small rural department, but they, they're very dedicated using their drones. It's a force multiplier for them. They have set in seven separate incidents rescued people with their drone products, which is just amazing. Um, we made a video showcasing their work. The police there, they responded to a rural single car crash at night. They found the car. Um, the, the, you know, this happens sometimes. You, you find the car in the middle of nowhere. They find blood on the dashboard, but there's no victim. This happens, the, the disoriented driver wanders away, um, but it was cold and pretty clear, it, it was, it was uh, I believe, sub-freezing or right at freezing. The driver was lying in a ditch hundreds of feet away and was not dressed for the cold. If it weren't for the police and their Inspire One, that driver could have died. So it was a great story. The report was full of great stories like that, um, but it was starting to feel a bit repetitive. I was trying to think, what do we do next for this? And doing another report the next year called Even More Lives Saved didn't seem like it was going to really advance the cause that much. So we started thinking, how do we treat drone rescues as a permanent feature of the public safety landscape? How do we make our list a constantly updated living reference that people could always look at to see the status of drone rescues, not just for a static report that comes out now and then. We wanted it to be available to reporters who were writing about rescues, to public safety agencies that needed examples when they made their proposal for the city manager. Um, so queue up an awful lot of coding and global translation and web development. And finally, in June of last year, DJI Drone Rescue Map came to life. And at the time, we counted 434 people around the world rescued by drones. Since the rescue, it, since the map went online, there's been another 329. That was 434 June of last year. Since then, another 329. That's like a 75% increase in barely 15 months. Um, it, it's the, the pace is quickening, and, and it, it's really astonishing. Um, if you've never poked around in this map, by the way, you should definitely check it out. Uh, the, the URL is at the bottom of the screen here, but you, you just search for DJI Drone Rescue Map. It should be your first result. It sorts the world into continents, and within each one, you scroll through a chronolo chronological list of rescues on the left, or you can move around the map on the right if you want to see it. Um, North Dakota, South Dakota, we're looking at you. You are a big empty space on this map here. I'm counting on you guys to start coming through. All right, each dot on the map expands. Uh, click on it, it gives you a description of the rescue, a photo if one is available from the primary news source, and a link to the news coverage or the Facebook post or whatever the primary source was uh, for that rescue if it's available. Um, there are buttons that you can share them on your own social media if you want. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's the single home for every drone rescue that we know of. There's 438 of them around the world as of this morning. And when you have 438 of anything, you're going to find some interesting outliers, right? So speaking as the person who typed every single one into the database, um, I just want to tell you, uh, indulge me while I tell you a few of my favorites. There have been at least three people around the world who were saved by a drone and then immediately arrested because they had been on the run from the cops. Um, one of them was a warrant arrest, but two of them jumped into the water to get away from the cops, but they couldn't swim, so they had to get pulled out to safety. In February of 2018, my, my, my after sales and uh, product maintenance people are gonna kill me for this, but I, I just think it's amazing. February 18, four-year-old boy is missing in a forest in Virginia after dark. The police put up their M210, they fly three flights, nothing happens. You see it on the fourth flight, the drone plummets to the ground, shattered to pieces. And a state, state trooper who was out walking by said, well, I'll, I saw where the drone landed, I'll go pick it up for you. And as he's walking over, guess what he finds? The missing boy. 
So I'll take it. Uh, later that year, I guess you could say this was the, the reverse situation that happened in northern Nebraska. Northern Nebraska, by the way, a place called Dakota City in Dakota County because it's two miles from the South Dakota border. South Dakota, you guys really got to step up, all right? Uh, a three-year-old boy was missing in a cornfield and multiple agencies showed up. They started searching. It was daytime. Um, the South Sioux City Police Department had a drone. They put it up. They didn't see the boy, but the boy saw the drone. After about 45 minutes, he just pops out of the cornfield and walks up to a sheriff's deputy and says, I just followed the drone. Hey, I'll take it. These are these these are wonderful stories to see for a lot of reasons. You know, um, I really hope that you can take some time to scroll through the map and look at some of these incidents. There are hidden gems everywhere on there. Sometimes when I find good rescues, I post them on my personal Twitter account. Uh, as you can see, I get pretty exuberant about them. I, I, I would love to think that you would feel the same way. I'd love to see if, if you find some of these that really capture your interest and you're able to share them. But, you know, they are amazing. And let me tell you, it is so rewarding and so inspiring to know that your company's products just helped save someone's life. I mean, everyone has bad days at their job, right? Everyone has a lousy day or, and something goes wrong. Maybe maybe your entire product line leaks out onto a blog before its official release. Maybe you feel like your own government is trying to sabotage the place you work based on rumors and lies. Everyone has bad days, right? That's when it's go great to go back and watch a story like this. This is the story of a, a six-year-old boy named Ethan House. He got off the school bus. He was playing with his dog. The uh, dog wanders into the field behind his house, and suddenly they vanish. It's a, it's a wet, boggy field. It's cold out. He is not dressed for the weather, and he vanishes. The sun goes down. It's a rural community. Everyone pulls together the image on the upper right there. You can see that is a lot of some of the 700 rescuers, the volunteers from town who showed up and started walking in line, uh, grid lines through the fields, trying to um, trying to 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 find this boy. It's really an, an astonishing feat of what they did. Um, so what happened? Uh, no, now I I'm sorry. I had a video. Uh, Pulled up on this. I'm sorry, give me one more minute while I find. Here we go. It's the moment a missing six year old boy is found alive by a heat seeking drone. Good job, buddy. 600 volunteers searched for 10 hours after a little Ethan House disappeared. I checked all the houses I haven't seen him. Ethan got off the school bus with his siblings and ran off to play with the family dog. That was the last time he was seen. And as temperatures dropped to near freezing, time was running out. Then this local photographer sent his drone airborne. I knew that I, I could be helpful. I just had to go. Night had fallen, so he triggered the drone's thermal imaging feature. Then at 1.50 a.m., he saw an image in a cornfield in Clear Lake, Minnesota. It was an unusual shape, uh, but I saw something that I thought looked like the dog. And so then in coordination with the deputy that was with me, we sent a ground crew out uh, with flashlights to see what it really was. It was Ethan and his dog, Remy. The incredible rescue also captured on his drone. And here are little Ethan and his Remy, a Brittany Spaniel that has a double coat of dense fur that sure made for a cozy blanket for Ethan to keep warm. You were calling for help when you were lost in the cornfield? Yeah. How loud were you saying help? Help! That's pretty loud. Ethan, did you hear the drone above in the sky? Yeah. To say the least, Mom Sherry is relieved. We were all overjoyed. There was lots of screaming. Yep. <laughs> I I love this story um, for a lot of reasons, and not just obviously because it's the story of a little boy whose life was probably saved by. The, the, a drone, but because it's the it, it this was ooh, pardon me this was oh for crying out loud 
This was an incident where a it wasn't a public safety agency that was able to that, that made the difference here. This was a no knock on public safety agencies. I, I, that's obvious, but it was a private citizen with a drone, someone who knew how to use a drone, and um, was out there. Hmm. Pardon me for just one second here while I try to get back to where I thought I was. All right. Um, where the... Uh, My computer screens have gone entirely black here. So forgive me while I add them for a moment. The, you know, the vast majority of the incidents on the DJI drone rescue map um, are incidents where a public safety agency was using a, a, a drone that they bought in a professional capacity, and which are amazing. But when you put drones in the hands of someone who is a, it, it, when you put drone technology in the hands of people who are able to do amazing things with it, you, you will inevitably have good outcomes, whether or not that person is a, is a public safety operator or a, um, when you give drones to people, when you have a government regime that allows drones to be used widely, when you aren't afraid of showing, uh, when you are not afraid of letting people use drones in a positive way, when you have laws that allow, that encourage the use of drones and know that there are risks that drones provide and figure out reasonable ways to measure that risk and come up with, um, with, uh, with, with common sense ways to address those risks, navigate them, mitigate them, put reasonable guidelines in place, you will save lives. When governments have common sense rules in place that allow people to try to fly drones freely, it will literally save lives. The corollary, of course, is that when governments are afraid of drones and they put onerous rules on their operation, they're literally condemning some people to death. I mean, that's a very harsh way of saying it, but it's hard to look at the drone rescue map and say that that's not true. It's reality. Drones can pose new risks, but we are long past the point where a broad drone restriction would make sense. Governments that embrace drones are reaping the benefits. Sometimes the benefit is life or death. Look at the amazing work that Zipline is doing in Africa, where they're delivering medical supplies to rural areas with long range BB loss flights. These drones, they are literally saving lives in different ways and they're doing it in Africa because countries there were willing to allow large scale BB loss experimentation that you still can't do in the, in the so-called first world. Um, and by the way, this points to what I freely admit is the biggest flaw in the drone rescue map. We have a very strong selection bias for incidents that I am personally likely to come across. It doesn't have nearly enough incidents coming from everywhere else. For example, we have only two rescues listed for the entire continent of Africa. Uh, one of them was a search and rescue in South, on a mountainside in South Africa. One was a zip line delivery of a blood transfusion that very clearly saved the life of a two-year-old girl in Rwanda. Now, I know that the penetration of drone technology is much slower in Africa than in North America, but there have to be more examples than that in, in Africa and all around the world. There may be dozens, there are probably hundreds of worthy drone rescues all over the world that are not included on the drone rescue map. I run Google searches every day. I prowl social media every day. <coughs> Pardon me. I put an awful lot of international news stories into Google Translate, but I live in America. The only language I speak is English. I have colleagues all over the world who send me examples from other countries, but they're also limited in what they see. So unfortunately, I know the drone rescue map is still missing plenty of great examples of what drones are doing all over the world. Um, so that brings me to the final lesson from the drone rescue map. 
which is that we need your help to find more of these rescues from all over the world. We are, we, we know that the drone rescue map, you're very good at picking up a story from a TV station in Michigan about a rescue on an icy pier, but it's really lousy at picking up, say, a Facebook post about a jungle rescue in the Philippines, uh, especially if it's written in Tagalog. Um, that's not fair to the rescuers who are involved. They deserve People who rally to save people in the middle of the jungle in the Philippines or Malaysia or anywhere else in the world, they deserve to get the same recognition as they would anywhere else. Um, it's not fair to the first responders who are using drones across the of these underrepresented swaths of the planet, even if they didn't they themselves didn't participate in the rescue. They need to know that their work and what they're doing to advance the cause of drones and public safety is appreciated and valued. It's also not fair to the people who rely on this map for an accurate picture of what drones are doing in the world. Um, we just have a blinkered view, unfortunately, and I need your help. Um, when you learn of a good candidate for the drone rescue map, an incident anywhere in the world, if you see something um, that you uh, pop something pops up on social media in a group of public safety managers, make sure that that agency submits that rescue to us. If you go to the drone rescue map, there's a link uh, at the bottom of the map. It gets you to this form and asks for all the basic information we need, which is basically just the, the date, the location, a brief narrative. If you're able to share an image from uh, from the, the, the video of what happened, great. Uh, the, remember, the drone doesn't have to literally save someone's life. It does need to have directly helped the process. It can't just have been flying overwatch during the drone. It needs to have made a, a substantive difference in how that rescue turned out. Um, and please, when you're submitting things to the map, remember, we want to put them, the, the information that you send us, we want to put it on the map. So don't include anything that's sensitive or confidential or could hinder your agency operations or could compromise the privacy of the people who are rescued. Um, so remember, we made the drone rescue map for everyone. Anyone with an interest in drones can understand the value of collecting every drone rescue in a single standard reference, and DGI is happy to host it. Um, back when we started this process in 2016, there weren't even enough incidents for a map. There were barely enough rescues to fill out a report. Then public safety embraced drones, regulators embraced public safety drones, the media embraced the amazing stories that public safety drones were generating for them. Everything changed. Uh, five years ago, there was no map. There was just a few dots. Today, there's hundreds of dots. Um, but no matter how amazing each one of those dots is, the, the, the dots alone are not the story. The story is the cumulative power of all those dots together making a global map. We are all lucky to be here at the start of this incredible shift in technology. We are all reaping the benefits. We should all be able to celebrate what it can do. Thank you for your interest in this topic. Thank you for your interest in the map. Thank you for putting up with my technical flaws and inadequacies here. I would love to take your questions. Um, please put them, I, you, you do not want me trying to uh, pick people and, and turn up, mess with the audio here. If you have questions, please put it in the uh, question format or the chat function here. The, um, I have a question, uh, is the implementation of FAA night operations rule this year having a visible impact on the pace of rescues that are happening at night? Um, I have not seen that yet, and I'm not sure if that's because uh, people aren't aware of it, people haven't uh, been doing it, or perhaps uh, agencies have already been flying at night if they think it's really necessary. Um, you know, the COA process has been helpful for a lot of them. Um, I, I have not seen that trend yet, but I know that I've seen nighttime rescues from all over the country and all over the world um, before the change was officially announced. I know I've talked to plenty of public safety officials who say, you know, when the chips are really down, uh, the FAA can, I, I will worry about the FAA later. I will go out there and do my rescue tonight. Um, a question here about the, uh, the Mav will the Mavic 2 Enterprise have a similar infrared scanner as the, the Matrice, the, the M300 RTK? Um, I do not know the answer to that. I can try to have, um, I, I, I don't know if, if I don't know the answer. I don't know if we're allowed to say the answer. If we have an answer yet, um, if we're able to get back to you on that, we'd be happy to. Now, folks, it's my job to sit here, so you're not wasting any of my time, please. I'd, I'd love to answer your questions about 
what we've learned in putting this map together, what trends we've seen, and how drones have been helping out. All right, hearing none, I will leave the chat window open for a little while, uh, for a few more minutes. But uh, for those of you who have no more questions, thank you for joining me again. I really appreciate your interest in this topic. And please reach out to us whenever you hear of something that might be a good fit for this map. Thank you. All right, I've got some additional questions coming in now. Uh, we have a question from Estonia. It says, in our small country of Estonia, finding missing people by drone has grown to be really common. This is great to hear. I only know of one Estonian rescue on the map off the top of my head. Please send me more details. Use that form and send them to you. The question is, uh, so the last find was just six days ago. Have you seen an increase of finds after the Mavic 2 Enterprise Advance was launched? Um, I don't know, actually. I have not analyzed based on that, and I'm not sure it would be easy to tease out um, by, by model. There's so many other factors at work. I would like to think so, because putting the thermal capacity in something small really was a game changer, and that's feedback we got again and again, um, not just because it's easier to carry around, easier to launch and fly, but also because having a drone under $10,000 with thermal capacity is a game changer for departments that could never dream of asking their bosses for $30,000 for a Mavic 2, uh, I'm sorry, for the M300 package. So the, the democratization of this technology, yes, it's making a difference. I, I wouldn't want to trace it to just one of our products, um, but it is a, um, it, it is, uh, it is it is a story of the technology as a whole. Um, a question, how many rescues involved are infrared? I would guess about half. I started going back through 434 incidents to try to tease out how many explicitly said they involved infrared, and it, 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 my mind reeled at, at the task of going back through all of them, so I, I didn't do all of it, but in the samples that I went through, it was about 50%. Um, Question, what is the capacity for the infrared scanner on drones? I I, uh, I assume you're talking about the thermal scanner. Um, I'm not the technical expert on the field of that, but we would be happy to connect you with one of our, uh, our technical experts on this who can give you specs on how the thermal imager varies between the Mavic 2 series, the M300s, the earlier models as well. Uh, Someone is in the comments saying that the size sensors on the Mavic 2 Enterprise Advance is 640 by 512, just as the H2, as the H20T the sensor on the M300 has. I hope that is correct. Um, yes, thank you for that, Marion. Um, which drones are best suitable for search and rescue? I use the Mavic Enterprise, but the analysis of the thermal camera is low. Um, I would. As I said, I'm not the expert. I would kick you back to some of the earlier webinars in this series, which are archived on the DJI Enterprise YouTube page. They, um, you have people who actually have gone out and saved lives with drones, talking about the different types of sensors and the um, the issues at work there. Um, I, I would rely on their knowledge a, a lot more than I'm on in this. Um, I think you will find it extremely helpful and certainly worth an hour of your time before investing in a new drone uh, capability for your agency. I believe that is all the questions that we have. Oh, do I have a couple of others here? I think that is all the questions that we have here. Uh, I will leave this open for a couple more minutes just in case any more pop in. Again, thank you for those of you who've stuck with me here. I uh, really appreciate you joining.
Uh, another question came in, do the rescues have an average uh, height of the rescue? Um, was there an average elevation at which the drones were flying during the rescue? Um, it would be very difficult to pull that together just because in, in most of these cases, I'm pulling them from news stories from in some cases, Twitter posts that agencies put up when they successfully do a rescue, and it just doesn't have a lot of that detail in it. Um, from 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 my anecdotal observation, uh, rarely are you pushing up to 400 feet to, to the legal limit in the U.S. Um, it, it seems like a lot of the flights are in the 50 to 100 foot range, which is enough to give you a, a a decent view of the terrain around you, but it is still detailed enough to be able to see uh, to to spot something around you. Uh, the, the, as you know, the aerial perspective it can be shockingly different from what you see on the ground, even from 40, 50 feet up. Uh, there are, uh, we have cases from all over the world where someone is lost in tall grass or scrub where from the sky it's blatantly obvious there's a woman in a purple dress lying in a, in a big open, uh, uh, in a, in an endless expanse of brown dirt and dark green scrub and she sticks out immediately as soon as you put a drone up but from the ground unless you're right on top of her you can walk around for hours and never find her so you, the answer is you don't have to be that high and when you are lower you're able to fly through and uh, especially if you're using um, software that can stitch together different imagery um, you can combine them to get a full search pattern uh, again in the uh, the webinar a couple weeks ago had some great examples of how different agencies have developed protocols for how they fly, how they take imagery, how they sample, um, how they oversample the areas that they find to be able to do this. All right, I believe that's all the questions. And uh, someone has oh, one last one in here. Um, uh, a question about how we plan to support Mavic 2 and Enterprise Advanced through various first responders organization um, and how that will be integrated into flight management software. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Reach out to us and I will be glad to connect you to the people who will be able to answer that. All right, we are just up at about an hour and someone has started running their lawnmower right outside my window here. So I am gonna end this webinar now. Thank you again for joining. Uh, I am overwhelmed by the interest and I hope that this is really meaningful information for you and it really helps you and your pursuits going on. Thank you again.